Welcome to the Workforce Link podcast, where we're offering forward thinking conversations for the workforce, linking employers and job seekers to a brighter tomorrow. I'm your host, Sunday Joe Graham with the Central Workforce Development Region, and I am glad to be back for another episode of the podcast. So here's a question. Is it really okay to ask for accommodations at work? when it comes to uh, function challenges like ADHD, which actually is recognized as a disability under the Americans with Disability Act. And, and as an employer, how do you address those concerns? That is what we are gonna talk about on today's episode of the Workforce Link podcast. We're gonna explore various ways which employers can provide reasonable accommodations to support their team members. And we're gonna do that with today's guest, Michelle Raz. Michelle is a career specialist and coach. She's the owner of RazCoaching.com. She's the author of Happiness Plus Passion Plus Purpose. Love that title. And she is the co-founder of Thrivester.com, which is an academic coaching company for high school and college students. As a board certified coach, she uses her expertise with executive functioning challenges to help people find their purpose and success in the workplace through the lens of ADHD. And so we're also going to cover why it's essential to establish an open and non-judgmental line of communication between employers and team members. So whether you're an employer looking to make adjustments to better support your staff or you're an employee seeking guidance on how to communicate your needs effectively, this episode is for you. Before we do that, though, I want to invite you to subscribe to the Workforce Link podcast so that you can be notified as soon as a new episode pops up. And if you haven't already, please leave us a review. Let us know what you enjoy about the show, and we would be super grateful. All right, now let's dive into today's episode on navigating disability accommodations in the workplace with our guest, Michelle Raz. All right, Michelle, thanks for being here today. We're honored to have you on the podcast. Looking forward to having a a great conversation with you today. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, So I found an article um, about a month or so ago called um, Disability Accommodations That Employers Can Easily Act On to Retain Employees. And as I was reading through it, I just, I loved it because it's so simple yet profound. And so I am excited to have a conversation with you today on uh, how we can speak to employers, but also how we can speak to those team members as well who um, may be struggling with some type of, of disability. Uh, so looking forward to, to diving in with you today. Yes, absolutely. It's uh, we can really go down some different avenues with this, right? So, so tell me a little bit about you, um, what you do, how you got started in this, and um, just take it away. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, so, I've been in the field of um, working with students and uh, executives and uh, business owners, entrepreneurs for the last fifteen years. And through that, um, I really began to recognize the need for um, specifically the workplace. And this is near and dear to my heart because my, my own father was an entrepreneur and big businessman in um, Portland, Oregon growing up. He um, got into the field of um, tech and barge operations at, um, you know, in his early 30s. And it was a tough industry to break into. These companies had been there, in there for 100 years. So he was a bit of a maverick, hard um, person. Interpersonal skills were really difficult, but he had this drive, he had this talent, and, and people were amazed at his abilities. But there was a disconnect with his ability to interact, to retain his own employees. And throughout my life, I was able to observe this and formulate you know, ideas of how things could be different. Then within my own family, my daughter, um, you know, was having struggling in school and whatnot. And I took her in and had her tested in the word ADHD was the first time I really mm-hmm. heard about this. This was some time ago. And a light bulb went on. I thought, oh my goodness, this has been what it was for within my own family, undiagnosed, you know, back you know, it's fairly new. And even with my own daughter, I, I got into the school system and there was no real avenue to go for her. Um, and she was brilliant, bright, but really st- struggling with task initiation, task completion. Um, she would understand concepts and follow through. Um, she was blurting out things and getting in trouble in the classroom. And that started my journey to help her. But then it began 
connecting the dots through the history of my own upbringing because it's you know passes down to the family. And I, I realized that my own father was this brilliant businessman who went undiagnosed. And, and he probably had a few different diagnoses that just weren't. Uh, but that fueled my desire to bring out the best in somebody, in their potential, by looking at their strengths and then helping them navigate their weaknesses through strategies and different routines that they can um, put into place and also resources. So that really initially began my journey. And then I ended up authoring a book around this um, called Happiness, Passion, and Purpose. And the point of that book was being able to find your ideal career path based on your strengths, first of all, and your weaknesses and looking for solutions around those weaknesses. So again, developing these strategies um, and resources for people to say, hey, you know what? You're an amazing person. Your your actual you know deficit is actually a gift for you because of your adaptations that you have made throughout your life to either mask it, cover right. it up, deal with it, and and that means that you have worked somewhere else over in your life to develop something else that makes you really stand out. Um, and you know whether it's a, um, a um, Tension deficit disorder, or you know, you're on the spectrum, but you're high functioning. You you've got a talent, and mm -hmm. just it needs to be um, addressed. And and these people come constantly come up against um, employment issues. I mean, my father was his own boss, so you know he he had to deal with that. But I'll tell you, he went through employees because of right. the um, the interpersonal skills and and not being able to be really organized. Um, with different aspects of his life. And so it was trying. And, and that's what I find with so many people with that are neurodiverse, that they are struggling in some way in their job force, but there's a barrier to getting that help because they're fearful of what the consequences might be. Will they be judged differently? Um, and, and so that has been my passion to help these people be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, you know, you talk about the, the strengths and the weaknesses. And sometimes I think we, we always, not always, we can get this idea that weaknesses are just bad. And that's not necessarily the case. They're just not our, our strongest point. But having somebody help us recognize how we can grow in that weakness, I think is, is huge. And I think a lot of times we, we kind of skip over that and, and miss that point. And we ask that in an interview, what are your, what are your three strengths? What are your three weaknesses? Which are important questions, but sometimes that also puts us in a box. Yes, exactly. And so what are the repercussions of that coming forward? And, and this is where I would like it to change in the workforce. Um, and I, I will say this, it has changed. It, it, or I should say it is changing. It's evolving since when I first started out with this. Um, it, people are receptive. They understand. It, it's been really helpful for people that have had challenges come up and you're in sharing their successes with other people so that employers are embracing it. You know, it's really wonderful to see this um, neurodiversity, DEIB, you know, and I really focus in on the inclusiveness and the belonging of my clients in the workforce. So, and, and of course it can be any walk of life, any, any gender, no matter what, but they're um, not feeling inclusive because the workforce isn't really designed in many aspects to them. And so they're really struggling with those weaknesses and trying to really show their strengths and they have nowhere to go for help. So that's why I ended up developing um, a, a program for uh, training managers to be able to identify this, to be able to have skills and strategies and tools, uh, you know, boxes to work with those people versus being at the water cooler complaining about so-and-so didn't make that, you know, deadline again, they're late to work again, and, you know, they're emotionally fragile or explosive. And be a problem solver, be a creative problem solver. That's going to help the end result of the company. Mm -hmm. you know, so you, 
provide this. Yeah. So you provide the solution for employers. Tell me a little bit more about that. Okay. Yeah. So we have executive functioning challenges. Okay. So those are a myriad of different things. So we've got, uh, you know, people struggling with time management, with um, short-term memory, uh, with emotional regulation, huge one, and um, man organization, planning, prioritizing, task initiation goes along with this. And so identifying somebody in the workplace, you know, I, I have a, a checklist that you can go down. And if you've got somebody identified as they're not meeting their potential, so I say, you know, a high potential, and it could be an executive or it could be somebody that you're looking at grooming, bringing up, but there's some hesitation there and, mm -hmm. and being able to identify what those hesitations are. And, and granted, there's other reasons, right, um, of besides just executive functioning challenges that might be temporary for somebody. So you have mm -hmm. to look at the event in their life going on, those kind of temporary things. And then I would hope that the company would have grace on those that person for that. And so going through that, like, for instance, um, if you're noticing that somebody doesn't communicate a lot, they might, they could have inattentive type of ADHD. They could be on the spectrum and interpersonal skills is not a strength. And, and when somebody is forced to do something that is not in their wheelhouse, mm -hmm. other areas of their work and, and their, their ability to do the work is affected because their emotions get elevated and they are feeling frustrated. They might feel shame. They might have a trigger from before, you know, in their childhood where, oh my gosh, I have to like go up and, and do something in front of the classroom. We, you know, whatever it is, we don't know what baggage we all carry and bring forward into it. But being able to be aware of that and say, okay, this is an executive functioning challenge where they may be struggling with interpersonal skills and communication. And so rather than trying to just tell them what they need to do, you can offer some tools and strategies. So for instance, um, you could have very clear and concise language in a written format so that they can visually take that in mm -hmm. and understand what it is that you're expected of them and be able to respond in a written manner. That is something that can help a lot of people that are struggling with the interpersonal communications. Um, and another twofold is that is that if somebody has ADHD, they may really struggle with processing information. And so we have you know different ways of learning audio, audio, visual, visual, kinesthetics, and they may not be an audio person. And they may need that visual. It may be something where they have a hard time breaking it down, but they have developed a technique to be able to read and be able to decipher it. So that, that's really one right. example. Um, and, and that can be something back in the classroom, you know, where you, um, you can have audio recordings of somebody's in a meeting, but you know, they're always checked out. They don't, re they don't retain the meeting. Um, they really rely heavily on the meeting notes and maybe the meeting notes aren't great, or maybe the meeting notes didn't happen. And so there's a lot of technology pieces out there where mm -hmm. somebody can, you know, transcribe that and record to text and then they can digest it later. And this happens not only in the workforce, but, you know, academics as well, if you're in training and whatnot, and you've got somebody and there's some kind of a disconnect, you have, you have to look at it from a different perspective. It's not, why aren't they getting this? But it's, how can I deliver this to them? It would be one, another technique for somebody to be asking, you know, in the workplace. Yeah. So that's just one example. Yeah, the way you phrase that question changes everything. It really does. Hey there, just want to interrupt for a quick second to tell you about something really amazing that's happening in the central region of Missouri right now. Are you a business owner or a manager who needs assistance increasing your profit margin and building a strong workforce? Well, guess what? Now is the time to take advantage of our employer services. The Central Region Missouri Job Centers are ready to help. Available at no cost to you, we offer a variety of employer services, including job matching, consulting, work opportunity, tax credits, on-the-job training, incumbent worker training, transition assistance, and more. 
You can get all the details at cwdregion.com slash employer services, or you can email us and you can find all of the information and the links to that in the show notes below. We look forward to assisting you with all your employer needs today. And now back to our interview with Michelle Raz. So you give some some great tips in this article on the, the um, disability accommodations, um, some topics to discuss, some common ways to manage some of the problems. And one of the examples that you've given here is, is ADHD. But can you just kind of go over um, a few of those steps that can just some simple steps that can help employers um, and job seekers know what to look for, know what to ask for? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So uh, for the employer, and this is, you already have your employee, right? They're hired, they're in the system, is looking at those different areas of the executive functioning. So if you've got somebody that's been brought to your attention, or you're just noticing through observation, maybe it's a 360, uh, maybe it's the employee themselves or a coworker, go down the checklist. You know, this is very top level, you know, global of it because there's very specific techniques that can happen in each mm-hmm. category. But here, here's some things like if you're looking for somebody with ADHD and on an emotional level, emotional regulation level, are they somebody that you notice shuts down really easy when things get complicated? Do they back down and they don't perform well mm-hmm. or they don't perform at all? Do they come into a meeting and misunderstand? They guess what the, what the intention of the meeting was and they miss the mark. Um, and so then they get elevated. Their emotions are elevated. So why is it their emotions are getting elevated? Um, they're hot headed, you know, that might be one in the workforce or they're just, they're non-reactive. Well, if you peel mm-hmm. back the layer a little bit, um, you can see, well, you know, identify the trigger. What was it with that person that set them off? When or when was it in that meeting, if if they're in a meeting? And you can look look back to it and say, was it the delivery of the message? Was it that they didn't understand it? And that would be something along the lines of helping them have that visual and having a technique in place for them to have a written piece. Um, Was it that they um, were just checked out? And so then were they having a hard time keeping their attention during the meeting. And, and so if, if it's a focus issue, like an ADHD focus issue, um, there's, there's some little techniques that you can use. And, um, you know, we, we talk about stress balls and things like that for um, students in classrooms. This is a really good, not only stress ball, but what it can do is take your mind. If you're in a meeting and, and you have something in your hand that you can be focused on, it takes a distraction away from your mind wandering to give it something over here so that you can actually pay attention. So mm-hmm. back in the days when, you know, maybe when you were in school and you're in a meeting, you've got somebody with a pen, right? And they're just like this. It's so annoying, right? You're just it drives me nuts. <laughs> they, it's a tool and a technique to get that focus off of yeah. that extra energy so they can actually yeah. pay attention. But there's other techniques that people can use um, and uh, I, I just did an article. I, don't, I didn't put it out there yet, but you know, one of there's this unscientific thing that you can do is chewing gum. So, like somebody that cannot focus and their mind is wandering, with, but you, there is something about chewing gum that takes the focus off of that, so that you can actually get work done. It occupies mm-hmm. that, your mind in that direction, so that you can get something done. Um, and and so those are just some fun, common little tricks that you can do. Um, so that, that's in like an emotional regulation and, and just peeling back the layers of what it is that's really going on. Um, and so if the person feels um, heard by their employee that I'm, I'm noticing this about you, um, I have, you know, some thoughts of something that could help you. Um, and then having this, you know, go to, you know, like the my toolbox of, you know, strategies for different scenarios that is, that can really help the employee. And, and there's a whole approach to it too. I have to back up because if you're a frustrated employer with the employee that is having the issue, you have to be very careful about the way you present it, right? Because mm-hmm. we don't want to be shaming them. Um, you know, people know you, people don't leave 
jobs, right? They leave relationships in jobs. Mm -hmm. And so if, yeah, if, if they feel valued and, and they're recognized for their strengths and we all have flaws and weaknesses we can you know work on and you present it in that way where it's an, an encouraging, like, hey, you are, you know, amazing in that sales job. And I'm, I'm noticing though that, you know, the follow-ups that you're doing, um, you're, you're, um, you're behind. And so, you know, what, what can I help you with? And so that is something that is really important to establish that trust, that mm -hmm. environment where people can feel safe to talk about their um, challenges. They need to be able to feel vulnerable, first of all, right? Right. <laughs> then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that's the thing that when, when individual clients come to me, cause I've, I've worked one-on-one -on -one many, many years and I still do, but that's the number one thing is they don't have a safe place to go and be vulnerable with, but they can mm -hmm. with me. And, and so, um, or any kind of coach in an industry, you know, that is supporting an employer, that's another valuable tool for a company to use is that, um, support that you have. Mm -hmm. and, and honestly, um, you know, there's differences between internal type coaching and external, but if you can do an inclusive environment as a company and, and have that theme, which again, we're making progress towards that, then they, they're feeling safe to come to you. There's a lot of companies will have a neurodiverse groups and then you, you and it's completely on their own through the company. Um, and then there's people that they can network to bring people in to help these, um, employees with different strategies and tools. And so I've, I've worked in that capacity as well. So, so anyway, number one, going back, if that safe environment is there and you're recognizing something, mm -hmm. there is these different tools that you can use. And so for instance, you've got somebody that's late all the time, you know, their, their time management issues. It's, it's not like they don't care about the job and, and they might, you might have an attitude, other oh, nonchalant, they just get there when they get there. But again, peel back that layer and say, how can we help you get to work on time? But we, you know, we really value you when you're on time. And I notice that you're really present when you're on time and you contribute a lot to the meetings. I notice that when you're late, it takes you a while to be able to focus in on the work. And how does that make you feel? you know, in, in the workplace. And, and most of the times, if you have a safe environment, they're going to say, well, I come in flustered, hot. I, I don't have, um, you know, my brain capacity is not there. And so you can start to say, well, you know, here's some techniques you can do for time management. And, you know, if we're, if we're talking about showing up to work on time, you can back it up to their morning routine at home and then talk about when you can start meetings and, and things like transition times, I cannot tell you how many people do not realize whether you're an employer or employee, how much time is lost in transitions. Mm -hmm. Can you dive but, more into that? I think that's so important, the transition time. Yeah. So um, I say to clients, when you're scheduling your day out and you've got a project from one to two, you got to have 15 minutes on either side, 15 minutes beforehand to get into that mental state, that mental flow. And people with executive functioning challenges really need to do this because they're already um, sifting through and trying to figure out to prioritize. They they want they have a time blindness, so they're, they're tr they usually are trying to meet some kind of deadline that they know they really don't do. And and so I'll ask them, you know, well, how much time does it really take you to get into that flow? Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes they'll say, well, I can't get into the flow, but they've never allowed that transition time. They've never allowed them to come up with their own ritual for going into a task. And, and I would say that for an employer, like if you're working on a team project and you, you have a role of this employee to be, you know, the leader of it, or they're contributing some kind of material, um, prepping ahead of time and giving them the steps ahead of time of what what you need to do to be before you get to that meeting so that they are somewhat forced to look mm -hmm. at your notes, review it, sit down. I personally will, will tell, you know, work one-on-one -on -one with them and say, um, take some deep breaths, sit, 
down and pause and just look at what you're going to be doing. Look at what you want to accomplish and what the plan is in that particular meeting. And then relax, get, get that cup of coffee, water, whatever it is, but give yourself enough time so that you can be present and mm -hmm. listening and, mm -hmm. and gather what you need. Cause a, a lot of the clients that I work with, their mind is racing and they need to kind of let go of that chatter and have that mm -hmm. calming effect before you go into a project. Um, and I'm sure you, you've done this and we, and we, we all do this, right. Where we, we overschedule ourselves and we come in hot, as I say, mm -hmm. and, and you're just reeling. You're, you know, you're, you're trying to get traction. And then there's other days where you float and noticing what the difference is in your mental capacity and the mental energy that you, you took. So you might say, well, I don't have 15 minutes. Well, okay, maybe even five minutes, but noticing and becoming aware of when you take that time for a transition in between what the productivity is on the mm -hmm. outside. Yes. The experiences, the self-reporting is I was able to do twice as much as anybody else because I was mentally prepared so that 15 minutes that they took actually was given back to them and then some because yeah. they took that time to be mentally ready for the task yeah. at hand. And, and I think, I mean, it's just my own personal opinion, but we all need to do that. We all need a minute, right? I just always say, give me a minute and a minute could be a minute and it could be 15 minutes, but, um, to just recalibrate. And, um, I think that's so important because we, we already live in a society of go, 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 go. And our attention spans are crazy and we're constantly distracted by our phones and all the things. I mean, and so, Okay. I think that applies to all of us, not just any, somebody that's struggling with something. It's all of us. Absolutely. So I, I love this um, analogy I had, and I, I mentioned this just recently. So the neurodiverse person right, is, has extreme highs and extreme lows of their abilities and whatnot. But does it mean that we, we don't, everybody doesn't. So right. depending on life events, they might be up or down, but the difference is with a, you know, a neurodiverse um, person is that it's it's more accentuated so we can all benefit from these um here, here's a perfect example and i know everybody can relate to this um employers employees is you've booked your day out and you don't have the transitions and you you fail at the end of the day because you're like oh i'll, I'll take notes or i'll document that afterwards and then your day goes on, you get to the evening and you're tired, you're spent because you've just gone back to back to back to back and you haven't given yourself a break. And then you forget to do the notes or you can so say, I'll do it the next morning. My mind is fresh. And then you forgot. What, yeah. What is, yeah. What happened I'm so evening? guilty. I, talk, I am too, you know, but when I enact the buffer zones yes. and I consciously saying, do not and a meeting and then go straight into another meeting. And when that happens and you build that buffers in, you are so much more productive and the quality of your work is better. Yes. Uh, but we are in a hurried world, right? Yes. Meeting, and, meeting. And, and now we're, we can do it, you know, remotely. So we're in our homes and there's no transition time. There's no water cooler talk. So we can just go from task to task all day long or get distracted, you know, on the internet or, or whatnot. So um, that I think is a really important piece to recognize, Absolutely. not only for the um, employee, but the employers too, is that when you're asking these people to do these different things, that you've got to accommodate them for whatever transition that they need, and especially mm -hmm. if you're noticing um, that they, you know, are a neurodiverse person, it's even more mm -hmm. so because it takes a little bit more effort to get what they need um, done. Mm -hmm. and, and I really recommend a ritual. This can be training your brain that when I um, sit down, I take a long breath, I, I you know, take, have, you know, your favorite cup of tea, coffee, whatever it is that in your brain, that's okay. I'm ready. You know, review something ahead of time. Um, yeah. and it's easier said than done. And I know it. So this is where I go into the planners. Okay. So what does your employees planners look like? I was just getting ready to bring that planner up. I um I am a huge advocate of the full focus planner. I don't know if you've heard of it or not with Michael Hyatt. I swear it's like my second brain, but you mentioned ritual and that's what made me say it because there's a place in here 
Um, and I just started a new quarter, so I don't have mine filled out yet, but there's a place in here where you can actually put your daily ritual. Like what are your startup activities? What are your ending activities? And um, it's so helpful. It really is. It, 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 it absolutely is. And it's so individualized. So this is another piece about my you know program and training program is that we really need to be customized and individualized for the different type of person. And, and even though you can have the same tool for everybody, but the ritual piece is like that my ritual and your ritual is going to look completely right. different. Right. Um, if, if um, you know, somebody gets up and they just get going and they don't take that time to quiet their mind, meditation, whatever tool they need to quiet their mind in the morning to just start the day intentionally. Um, and you're just, you go through that day for me, reacting to everything. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Versus being proactive and taking charge. Like yeah. I own this day. I charge this day. Yeah. And so I think you can have a ritual, not only at home, but in the workplace. Mm -hmm. So some, you know, what, what is your ritual? Is it coming in? If you, if you're somebody that's really struggling with organization um, and you, you schedule time in um, that the first thing you do is desk, desk organized. The things from yesterday put away, you know, what, what you're working on today in front of you. And by having that ritual, that may very well turn into being, that's what st um, starts my day and gives me motivation to get the task done by creating that clean space to start from. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of people that have a large a hard time with, you know, the stacks of papers and, and things in the organizational piece, they really need some accountability around that because mm -hmm. it doesn't come easy. We all know we should do these things, right? When we're speeding around, we don't have transition times. We don't have rituals that get us, you know, in that perfect workflow, our productivity goes down. You know, are you going through your desk searching for things that you know are there? Um, and, but if you had it organized in a place that, piece would be much easier for you to do. And, and so, um, I, I do, I, I, the managers would behoove themselves to have these accountabilities. So going back to these executive functioning challenges, you know, whether it's emotional regulation, you know, we just, we just talked about, um, organization and now in time management and planners is, are they doing it? Are they using the tools and tricks and strategies that you've learned to deal with them? And they need that accountability. Of course, you know, th that takes a whole different approach, which I, I do in my training is how to get them to be accountable and want to be accountable in a positive way, not because they're going to get fired. That's like the right. worst you can do because <laughs> it just starts this downward spiral. Right. But again, creating a safe and in positive environment um, will help this. And let me give you a story, a real quick story. So I had a client and he was an IT guy, brilliant guy. Um, he had a um, job, I won't say with what industry, but anyway, or what company, but a job that he, he came to me privately. He had funds that were able to pay for me through his company, which was fantastic. Um, and he was fearful he was going to lose his job. Constantly being um, reprimanded for um, missing, missing little things here and there. Um, showing up late and he was in a real negative downward spiral feeling very shameful feeling inadequate and he was a high level it person and we were looking through and deciding well you know do you do you want to stay here or do you want to leave the job and he would have stayed if he felt safe to get the help and um kudos for what he was doing well mm -hmm. versus everything he wasn't doing well and in the end, we had to identify what he wanted in an employer and it didn't match what the company culture was. And so he, I helped him be, look for a new job. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you the success story. It took about a year. He not only doubled his income, but he is in a workplace that values the culture, that values positive reinforcement and they constantly give that positive feedback of what is going right. Mm -hmm. He is now in a place he knows his weaknesses. These employees that come in know their downfalls because they've mm -hmm. lived a life of shame and embarrassment, right. living up to their potential. 
Right. And he wants to work on it still with me. And we talk about his climate and culture and he loves his job. He, he's going above and beyond now. So this is what happens when you turn the tides and you start to have this positive, inclusive environment. Um, you still have your expectations for work to sure. get done. Don't sure. you? You're not watering down qualities. Right. As a matter of fact, you, what you're doing is you're increasing the quality, the productivity, because now you have motivated people that feel supported. And this is what has happened in this guy's life. And it has been transformed transformational to see this change because of the culture, the safety, and the strategies and tools that he knows are available to him that he's working on on his own now. I love you know, that. Not with that, that top down kind of, you know, if you don't do this, you're out or all, all the consequences. Right. Yeah. Beautiful. Right. I think there's such a great lesson to be learned. You know, um, I hear a lot of people um, just bashing on the millennials. They're lazy. I, you know, we have to teach them this blah, 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 blah. And sometimes it gets really hard to hear because it's like, but what if you just try to meet them in the middle? Not that you have to babysit them, not that you have to change your organization for them, but what if you somehow tried to meet them in the middle? And I kind of think that applies, um, to this as well. You know, you don't have to go change everything, but try to understand people more. And my, my question on this is there's, there's those employers out there who haven't uh, quite gotten there yet. Like you said, it's happening. So what do you say to an employer who says, look, I don't have time for this. I've got, I'm busy. I've got a company to run. I don't have time to sit down and babysit people. I don't have time to help them overcome this, you know, tough luck. What do you say to those employers? Well, I'd ask about, you know, first of all, do they have any statistics on their productivity levels and where their pain points are? How, how is this affecting the bottom line? And, and that's how you're going to get their attention because they need to have a personal buy-in to it. And first of all, right, they have to have that, well, gosh, um, the research shows, Gallup polls show that if I do, the, you know, if I offer this training and people feel like they're an inclusive environment, you know, productivity will go up, you know, 20% in my industry. So if you can show them and quantify the value of doing things different, you're going to get the buy-in. You're going to get their ear to listen. So that is the other piece. And then the other piece is, you know, kind of why I decided to do this training program is bringing awareness to it. Mm -hmm. When we identify these different checks points, I can guarantee you that the CEO, the founders, the, the managers go, they can recognize it in themselves as well. And then they go, oh, that's relatable. I can understand that. Or my spouse is like this, or, you know, my kid is like this. And so when you can educate them and, and bring that awareness up, I think they're more open to saying, okay, I, I get it. I can see how it can affect my business in a positive way to take a look at this. I, I, it is important enough to make time for this. I understand it now. And now I have the tools, we, you know, well, if you know, my, like a training program, like I have now I've got the tools and strategies. Um, but, and then you can a couple of choices. You can designate somebody, like if you have HR to, to work with somebody like me to bring that into the company or you can have outside, bring it in and, and just have it, have it done. But initially, you know, my, um, my thought is that, can you afford to not have time for this? It's a great question. Yeah. Can you afford to not have time? I think that's such a powerful question, especially the way the economy is today and the way the job market is today. I think that's a powerful question. And I'll tell you, I mean, I, I told you, I have an, another company. Um, that's educational academic coaching around EFS, executive functioning um, challenges. And I have trained coaches and whatnot. And it is not fun to train and train and train. You've invested this time, this money into this person. And you've, they've got a lot of strengths in them. Probably you, you, you hired them for a reason. <clears throat> and now you're looking at just throwing all that away. What's the value and the cost to the company there versus having 
a shift in how you approach these and having a system in place to be able to identify and work with it. I just yeah. wrote an article um, about this company up in Canada. This was recently up on LinkedIn, um, Otacon, and they specialize in hiring people on the spectrum that have um, really great computer skills. And so that happens to be an industry that works really well. And then they have all this support around their interpersonal skills, which can be common, you know, with people on the spectrum that are challenged with that. And if you go and find and do some research on the company, um, it's, you know, it's a real role model to be able, they've taken this concept of playing to their strengths and then providing or workarounds for mm -hmm. them to help them in accommodation. So um, whether it be the time management piece, um, a lot of, you know, visual aids can be something else, you know, to have very spelled out, visually appropriate um, steps. If people have a hard time reading documents, bullet points, uh, there are so many different tips and tricks that can help everybody, mm -hmm. um, you know, and not um, just one particular class of people. So um, these, we have a lot to learn mm -hmm. in how can really help this workforce and prevent, mm -hmm. you know, the, the turnover, the retent, you know, whether it's firing or people leaving because they're not feeling supported. Um, that's a huge cost. And there's so many things you can do and um, have, it's a shift in the company. Mm -hmm. and, but, and you have to see the value in it. Mm -hmm. And it, it is, I'd like to say we're all goodwill <laughs> and we would do it because we want everyone to be happy, but ultimately it's, oh, wow. That costs us a lot of money for retention or, or, or you know, what, whatever it is. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right. It, it all, it all boils down to, it's all about learning. And as long as we, you know, it's not perfect, it's not a perfect system, but as long as we're willing to keep learning, I think that changes everything. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, this has been a great interview, Michelle. Thank you so much. Do you have anything else that you want to we'll share with our listeners before we, before mm -hmm. we go? Uh, let's see. So, you know, somebody says, okay, wow, I, I, this really resonates with me and it's the employee, right? Going, what do I do? How do I, do, how do I, where do I go with this? Um, my, my suggestion is this for the employee is seek out who you feel comfortable and safe with. Know, know that source and do it in a way where you feel it's you know, in confidence and test the waters and see if they're willing to, you know, look at this further. Um, and there, there's a starting place, right? For the employer, I say, look at your bottom line, look at how much effort you're putting into training, retraining, correcting. And if you, you take a look at, you know, the, the tools in my course, um, implementing these really isn't like going out and buying, you know, specialized you know, equipment to make accommodations. These are real things that can happen in the place and the value that it can bring to the company as a whole. So for the employer, be open, try to raise your awareness of what these executive functioning skills are and how easily they can be accommodated. And for the employee, advocate for yourself, mm -hmm. find people that you trust and feel safe with. Mm -hmm. And you can start with that conversation is I'd like to talk about something that's sensitive to myself that I don't feel will have repercussions and, and hopefully it's HR or somebody, but find, find that ally in the company. If, and it, it's, it would take time, but you might mm -hmm. find, especially in our climate, thank goodness, um, people are more aware of it. Love that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, where can we learn more about you? Okay, sure. So my website is razcoaching.com. And um, if anyone, you know, was interested in the training program, I do like a free discovery call, you know, or email me. But um, yeah, Michelle at razcoaching, razcoaching.com um, is that. And then, of course, um, I know there's going to be people going, oh my gosh, my child has this and executive function, they're in college and whatnot. And so if anybody's kind of interested in what that looks like, you can go to thriveister.com. Um, okay. and that is my full blown, um, academic coaching around executive functioning challenges. Um, okay. and then, you know, on a closing note, this is all well said and done. And I'm going to say this with what I do in RAS coaching and what I do, you know, in Thrivester. 
but the proof is in the accountability. Mm. So if you're going to do anything on your, your own, the do it yourselfers, make sure you have an accountability plan. And, and I mean that in a positive way, action right? Is what I call it an action plan. So we have an academic action plan. We have a work employee action plan and the people are involved in that. They need to be involved. This is not, here's your action plan. Go do these things mm -hmm. with that person. It's a collaboration. And yes, the millennials like to collaborate. Um, you know, it, it, that was the education that they received, you know, right. they didn't have desks and rows. It was, it was all collaboration. Right. And the thing is, is that the creativity that comes out of that is immense. This is a whole nother subject, but, um, but do collaborate and involve them in the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think that sums it up. Well, the proof is in the accountability. I think that is a great way to sum it up. And we will share all the links uh, in the show notes for um, your websites so they, that people can have access to that. Thank you so much for being with us today, Michelle. I really appreciate it. I feel like there's some, definitely some things that I need to process uh, through this as well, just how and how I can be more productive. So thank you so much for uh, spending time with us today. Well, thank you for letting me share. You know, what I do is it's my life, my passion. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did. And remember to encourage your team to identify reasonable accommodations without feeling afraid to do so. A happy team makes a happy company. And you can learn more again about Michelle at razcoaching.com. And again, I will share the link to that in the show notes below. And if you've enjoyed today's episode, would you mind sharing it with somebody else that you think might benefit from it? We would be grateful. And don't forget to take advantage of all of our job center services available to you at no cost. You can find your nearest job center or affiliate site at cwdregion.com slash job centers. And again, we will share the link for you below. Have a great week and we will meet again in the next episode. Until then, remember this, there's always a brighter tomorrow if you're willing to find it. The Central Region Workforce Development Board Incorporated and COPIC are equal opportunity employers and programs. Auxiliary aids and services are available upon request to individuals with disabilities. Missouri Relay Services at 711.